Welcome to the Faith Lutheran Church Bible Study, The Triumph of the Lamb, a study in Revelation. Today in the Sunday class, we finish our discussion on the great prostitute and the beast from Revelation 17, and talk about the fall of Babylon from Revelation chapter 18. Let's listen in. Uh, let's start with the word of prayer. Father, thanks for this time to study your word, and we ask you, God, that your will would be done among us. Grant us your spirit and guide us through these heavy texts and remind us of your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, just to bring us up to speed on where we are, remember we have just came, we have just come, I should say, out of uh, the final vision of the last plagues. Uh, The last of the set of seven, so there are seven bowls, or if you have the King James Version, seven vials of wrath that were poured out on the world, uh, and that was the end of it all. Uh, This was the end of the wrath, it said. This is the end of the punishment. Uh, And then after the end of the punishment, we come into more punishment, so I don't know how that all works, but I think what we're seeing here is sort of a close-up on how the specific entities that are a problem for the church are going to be dealt with. So, we're going to see the destruction of the beast and the harlot, which is kind of what we're looking at right now, which both together represent uh, Babylon, which represents Rome, which represents all spiritual and political powers that work against the church throughout the history of the world. Okay, Um, And that's what we're kind of where we are at right now. Now, what we saw last week was this harlot riding on the beast, and we said this is the religious beast from some time ago of the unholy trinity, the religious beast riding on the back of the political beast, and here it looks like the religion has control, and really what this is a symbol of is the imperial cult in Rome. That's Caesar standing up and claiming to be God and have the authority of God and the language that is used to describe Caesar as king of kings and lord of lords, and all the things that we use to describe Jesus. He was claiming to be God himself, or a God, is probably a better way of saying it. And so the imperial cult is running uh, the polis, the city, the politics, right? And so the, the whore of Babylon is riding on the political beast. Now, um, it's very terrifying to see this. John is marveling at it, and an angel comes to him and says, what are you marveling at? And he shows them all these entities and all these things and, that are going to attack and go after the church and cause all these problems. And then he says these words, which we closed with last week, they're going to make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will conquer them. For he's the Lord of lords and King of kings. He's the one in charge. And those who are called to him and chosen and faithful. So the idea is, of course, uh, Christ wins. These people will not conquer the Lamb. And those who are in Christ will conquer with the Lamb. So far, so good? Okay. Um, Then, we find ourselves in verse 15. The angel said to me, The waters that you saw where the prostitute is seated are the peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. And the ten horns that you saw, and the... They and the beast will hate the prostitute. They will make her desolate and naked and devour her flesh and burn her up with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to carry out his purpose by being of one mind and handing over their royal power to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman that you saw is the great city that has dominion over the kings of the earth. Okay, so here he's saying, look, this prostitute is is Babylon and she has all this power. But soon uh, the political beast is going to turn on the imperial cult here and destroy it whatever that means Um, and so the evil ones are turning in on themselves and attacking one another Um, there's a good illustration of this sort of thing in C.S. Lewis's book The Screwtape Letters that uh, the demons use each other they never work with each other they use each other for their own personal ends and hope to uh, actually devour one another the different demons in that book if you've ever read it that's kind of how this is working here. There's two evil entities at work with one another, uh, and one turns on the other because they have their own purposes in mind. Okay. Um, let's see if there's anything else on here. Oh, notice here too that the whore of Babylon, the prostitute, the the, the woman who rides on the beast, uh, she is kind of uh, the anti-church, the anti-church, because on her are. Uh, she's seated on these waters, and they represent the multitudes, nations, and languages, and peoples. Throughout the New Testament, 
this is a way of describing the church uh, that Christ has called together people from every tribe, nation, language, and tongue, something along these lines. Here, uh, those who deny Christ, who are not written in the book of life, if you will, they're the ones who are following the woman, okay? Uh, and so they fall in her defeat as well. Um, and that's really all I have to say about those verses. Is there anything else you want to cover on that? Can we keep going? I'll take that as a keep going, Pastor. Very good. Okay. <laughs> so let's go ahead and read 18. Go ahead and do verses 1 through 3, please. Anybody? I'm good. Thanks, sir. <clears throat> the fall of Babylon. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons, and a haunt for every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her, and the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. All right, very good, thank you. So now we have another angel showing up, and this angel is described as um, having great authority and is very bright. Now there's going to probably be someone who will suggest maybe this angel represents Jesus, but we're just going to flat out say, as we've been saying the whole time, the angels don't represent Jesus, okay? They don't. Uh, though uh, they aren't Jesus, we should say, but maybe representatives of Jesus, if that makes more yeah, sense, yeah, makes okay? Sense. And so why would we say this one comes from Christ? Because he has great authority. Great authority. <clears throat> and only Jesus is described as having that sort of thing. Yeah. So he's working on behalf of Christ's yeah. authority. Yeah. He comes down from heaven, the abode of God here in Revelation. Um... And the earth was made bright with his glory. So whose glory does he have? Christ. Or Christ, Christ, right. Yeah. So so the picture you actually have here of this angel is almost more like Moses, really, coming down from the presence of God and speaking judgment on those who have broken uh, God's will or something like this. And remember when Moses would come down and the people would see his face, it would be uh, reflecting the glory of God. In fact, he would put a, a mask over his face uh, so as to... Uh, dim the brightness, so to speak. So uh, you kind of have that taking place with this angel here. And now he crawls out, calls out the mighty voice uh, that great Babylon has fallen and has become the dwelling place for all kinds of terrible stuff. Um, in, in the Old Testament, when uh, Babylon, Isaiah sees the fall of Babylon, he says, uh, you will become the dwelling place of jackals and hyenas or something like this. And the idea there is, people are done. You, this is going to be a, a, this place has no power anymore. It's going to be taken over. It's it's decimated. There's no strength left in it. Something along that line. And that's what you see here. Uh, this is a haunt for unclean birds and spirits and detestable beasts and for demons. Uh, nothing righteous is left in this place. There are no people. I mean, this is. It, it almost sounds like a haunted city. <clears throat> this is really what it sounds like. It's like a haunted city here. Um, this is what the commentary says. All that is left of the once proud city are the demons hovering over her corpse. I mean, that's, I think that's a good picture here. Like that haunted house scene. I mean, it's cartoony, but you've got a scary, crotchety old, rickety old house. That's a better word. Rickety old house. And the ghosts kind of coming in and out of the windows, you know. That's this. Kind of scary. Nothing but death and uncleanliness and impurity. Okay. Um, anything else on that? Um... Why is she overthrown? Why is she destroyed? It's right there in the text for us. How about that? Verse 3. 
She's misled the nations. Very good. So she's misled all the nations with her sexual immorality and all of her temptations and all of this kind of stuff. She's taken them uh, away from the Lord. Okay, And she's made them rich and she's made them wealthy and she's made them weak and now she's done for. They all depended on her and so pretty soon what we're going to hear is the rest of the world crying out in fear and mourning over the death of Babylon of Rome, of whatever nation they were looking for for their hope and salvation. Okay? Okay. Very good. Just keep on moving then. Alright. Another voice comes from heaven. Can someone read for us verses 4 through 8, please? I can. Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given, as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as queen, I am not a widow, and I will never mourn. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her, death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord God who judges her. Okay, so another voice. Now, what do you think? Who's this? Whose is this voice? I think this is Christ's voice. Why is that? Because the voice comes from heaven. Yep. It says, come out of her, my people. My people. Yeah, so this is going to be, I think you're right, this is Christ himself speaking uh, the word here. Um, I'm about to sneeze, and it is not happening. It's driving me nuts. Um, Are we assuming? Because it's not printed in red? Yes. Yeah, because it's not entirely clear if it's Christ or not. Now, you may have a Bible that doesn't have any of Christ's words in red. My Bible does have red letters, and there's not in yeah, this point. Not, not. Um, and the reason why there's a little uncertainty is if you read the last verse there, uh, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her, it would be kind of a strange thing for Christ to say that, because he's actually the Lord God, right. right? So some people say maybe it's the Father speaking. It's kind of superfluous, but the fact that he's referring to my people we're going to say it's probably God speaking. And if it's not God speaking, it's an angel on behalf of God speaking. So it's a set for all intents and purposes, this is God. Okay? This is what God has to say. All right? And he said, now this is great. Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins and lest you share in her place. Now, all right. So we had this long discussion some time ago about whether or not the Christians were on the earth in the midst of all the plagues and the bowls of wrath and all this kind of stuff. And I'm going to suggest that this is proof positive that they are. That they are. Because here the judgment of God is coming um, upon the earth. And God is saying, now that my judgment's coming, you're coming out. Now this is the time of separating the sheep from the goats here, so to speak. Okay, um, And this is not to say, like, don't come out of her now by the rapture so that she... So you don't sin like she does and don't have to undergo the plagues, but rather by sins and plagues there, I'm going to suggest it's referring to judgment. You don't have to take part in the judgment they're receiving because of their sins. You don't have to take part in the judgment that they are not, because they're not repenting because of the plagues, something like that, okay? And now this is actually a very interesting, we see this sort of thing happening a number of times throughout the Bible. Remember Sodom and Gomorrah? What happens in Sodom and Gomorrah with Lot? He's allowed to leave with his family. Yeah, the angels, right? They go in, and after seeing all this, they get out of here. You don't have any time. Go. And that's a great story. The angels are there, and they're like, you need to get out of here and flee. And Lot's like, well, where am I going to go? They're like, you don't understand. We're blowing this place up. We're destroying it. Get out of here. Well, where should I go? Go anywhere but here. No, they say, go to this place, like the, the mountains. So well, I can't go to the mountains. I'll die there. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to die here. <laughs> go away. So he finally gives them a good place to go. But yeah, it's like, oh, all right. Uh, there's another place um, in the book of Numbers where uh, two families, the, the tents of Dathan and Abiram from the Sunday school story. Uh, I don't remember this story very well, but God's going to destroy their tents. And so he tells all the people, get away from them. 
because they're going to die. And you see this also um, with with uh, the story when they the, and maybe this is that story when they're rebelling against Moses and Joshua and um, and Aaron, and they separate the people of God from the other people in their tents, and the ground opens up and swallows them. You know, so there's there's a taking out of a separating from. Uh, Paul says that uh, Jesus tells his followers to flee at the fall of Jerusalem. Uh, in the Olivet Discourse, he says, When you see these signs happening, run to the hills. Uh, woe to those who have babies who are nursing because they're going to have to flee uh, with an infant. You know, get out of the way because bad things are about to happen to Jerusalem. So get out and save yourself from this. And the other one might be St. Paul telling us in the same way in 2 Corinthians to come out of the midst of pagan idolatry. Uh, and any manner of living uh, that is, and any manner of living that's influenced in that way. So remember, he says, "Don't be yoked with an unbeliever," um, something along those lines. So um, don't take part in their sins. Now, uh, this is kind of what's going on here. Now the sins are heaped as high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Remember, we said God's remembrance even today in the sermon. Uh, he recalls his promises and leads his people forth with joy. He looks at the rainbow and remembers. His promise to know, which is just a phenomenal verse. We always think, oh, I look at the, the rainbow and it's a reminder for me. And the text says it's a reminder for God. Like God needs sticky notes or something. I don't know. But uh, it's, just, it's just a it's weird cool phrase. Note. It is. Yeah, that's right. There it is. That's right. There's a rainbow sticky note. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but God remembers his promises. He leads his people forth with joy. But for those who do not repent, for those who are not in Christ, there's our New Testament language those who are not in Christ, those who are of the harlot and the beast, God recalls their sins. And that's a terrifying prospect. <clears throat> On the day of judgment to say, here's what I remember you doing. Yo. Um, and I notice here it says that their sins are high, heaped as high as heaven. Uh, this may be making too much of this statement, but it kind of reminds me of the Tower of Babel. Right? Right? Uh, they're trying to build their way up to heaven. They're trying to construct something that's going to get them into heaven. Well, all they've constructed is their unrighteousness and their, and their unbelief. And that's what we see taking place here. Your sins are as high as heaven. That's a lot of sins. <laughs> right? Uh, and so the judgment that we see here, though it sounds harsh, is entirely just. It's entirely just. Okay. Uh, she will drink, and that's what the next verse says. Uh, pay her back as she herself paid back others. And repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup of sh that she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I will never see. Um, Interesting, the uh, reference to the Tower of Babel. They were trying to be like God. Yes. And so was she. Yes. I am the queen. Right. Well, yeah, that's right. I am the queen. And now you remember this. This happens a lot with the kings of the earth. Standing up and saying, nothing can conquer this. This happens to Nebuchadnezzar. He looks out and says, look all that I've made with Babylon. Nothing can destroy me. And then God, you know, plagues him. And he goes nuts for seven years and repents and all this kind of stuff. Or you think of Herod, too. Um, in the book of Acts, there's a story about Herod. And there's two groups of people. I forget who they are. I want to say Tyre. I'm not sure that's right. There's two groups of people that are having a big argument, a big political debate, border skirmish, something like this. And so Herod comes and he solves the problem. He fixes the problem. And everyone's thrilled with what he's done. And so he comes out one day you know, to look over the people and they all start yelling that he's as a god. He's as a god. You know, Herod is a god, something along these lines. And uh, Herod just kind of goes... Yeah. All right. Come on. That's right. Yeah. Let's let's hear some more. Let's hear some more. And God strikes him dead there, and he's devoured by worms or something like this. And you say, and this is great because we hear this and it's like, wow, all these weird stories only happen in the Bible. That story is recorded outside of the Bible too by a guy named um, Josephus. Josephus. Yeah. Josephus records the exact same story uh, that this is what happened to Herod. But because they look out and it's their pride that says nothing can destroy this. Look what I've built for myself. And they don't give glory to God. Um, and so Rome could just very easily have said, no one's beating Rome. Mm. We have the most powerful army in the world. No one's going to touch us. Nothing can defeat us. And it's when, no, when nations get hubris like that, that things go south. 
things to think about. It's not a fear tactic, Jack. I just want to be very clear. I'm not a fear tactic guy. I don't know if you heard the sermon this morning, uh, but I'm just pointing something out. Okay. Um, <laughs> We're lucky we have Josephus. <laughs> Aren't we? All right. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Um, good enough there. Um, the destruction comes uh, in a moment with fire. She's burned up with fire because the Lord has judged her. Okay. So here, who is the one who has looked so powerful? And I mean, this I think is how we want to read this. And you guys probably get this. It's just dawning on me as I go. Throughout the whole book, there's been a sense of. How long, O Lord, until justice is served? There's been a sense of the Christians probably being afraid. Like we saw in the last verse there where where the angel says to John, why are you marveling at this? We could read that just as easily. Why is this causing you fear, this terrifying beast that's drinking the blood of the saints? Why are you afraid of this? Because look what's about to happen to it. The Lamb's going to defeat the beast. He's going to defeat Babylon. Jesus wins. So in a sense, this looks bad, but it is nothing compared to the judgment that they're about to undergo. Don't be amazed by what you see. Something far worse is going to happen to them, and something far greater is going to be given to the church. And so it's in a sense, it sounds incredibly harsh at this point, but it is justly offsetting what they have been doing to Christ and his church the whole time. Does that make sense? So now the justice is being served. And justice is a terrifying thing if you're on the losing end. Okay? Okay. Right, let's keep going. Um, oh, this is, I mean, this is I, interesting. I, I think this passage is very fascinating. Can someone read for us, we'll just do these real quick, one by one. Uh, nine, verses 9 and 10. Sure. Go for it. Thank you. It's short. When the kings of the <laughs> earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Whoa, whoa, O great city, O Babylon, city of power. In one hour, your doom has come. Okay, now in Ezekiel, the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel witnesses um, the destruction of Babylon, the literal destruction of Babylon. He, he sees it prophetically. And when he does, all the merchants and the kings of the earth and all these other people mourn over the loss of Babylon. And so here what John is doing is sort of um, copying Ezekiel. Now he's actually seeing this, but he's saying, look, what I'm witnessing uh, happened to Rome is the same thing that happened to Babylon is the same thing that will happen to all these worldly powers that think they cannot fall uh, when Christ comes again, okay? So uh, he's just making that connection there for us. It's also worth noting this. When, when God says in the Old Testament he's going to judge nations, one of the things he says is they will become a byword and people will wag their heads when they walk by going, yeah, such a shame, such a shame. All that power, all that glory, wasted, pathetic. And so that the name of that nation would be shamed throughout the rest of history, something like this, you know. Um, and you see that take place at the place probably like Sodom and Gomorrah. That does that place never has never had positive connotations. You know, it just hasn't. Um, <laughs> uh, and so that's kind of the idea there. All right. So here we have the people wagging their heads. And what we're going to see then um, is three groups of people at the sort of funeral procession for Babylon, a funeral procession for Rome. We're going to see the kings of the earth. We're going to see the merchants, those who had commercial gain from them. And for whatever reason, uh, the merchants from the sea, that is the shipmasters and the seafarers and the sea people and all that kind of stuff. So uh, those are the three categories of people who are going to be mourning the fall of Babylon. So the first one we get here that Dave just read to us is the kings. And notice that they are at a distance. Now these are not the kings that we've read about already, the, the ten horns that turn on the beast or something like that, because I think those are all kind of part of Babylon itself. Babylon being the harlot and the beast together. Uh, these are just the other kings of the world who have sort of, for lack of a better phrase, gotten into bed with Babylon, gotten into bed with Rome. Uh, and as they see their powerful allies defeat, they're beginning to recognize their own demise. And what you'll notice with all three of these uh, laments 
is how they all say this a single hour your judgment has come and there's almost as you read it I think you want to read it as sort of a breathtaking fearful look like this Rome Rome thousand year empire massive thing ruled the world nobody could touch it and in an hour it's gone yo and it's terrifying think of I mean I I don't want to equate God's just punishment with 9-11 but I want you to just this follow my analogy here how long does it take to build the two towers how much time and effort and energy and, and manpower and m wealth and money, all of this goes into building those two things. And it took 15 minutes. I mean, the planes hit and those things just went. And you just sit there and you're like, how, <clears throat> perhaps we're not as strong and powerful as we think we are. Um, and I think that's like the look on their face, like this, the proud New Yorker who looks on the horizon and sees the smoke going, all of that in just a minute? Just one hour? Yo, who are we dealing with here? <laughs> right? I mean, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's, that's the, I think, the tenor of, of the passage. Um, and, and so it says that they, they were the ones who committed sexual immorality with her and lived in her luxury. They used her for their own gain. <laughs> And now she's gone. And if they were relying on her for their own wealth and their own luxury and their own power, this is also a cry of fear. Woe, woe. Remember, that's funeral language. That's what you sing at someone's funeral. And so the picture is of um, a husband mourning his wife, but that's a little too um, kind. So perhaps um, the picture here, I think, is one of 36, 36 million men who have visited uh, AshleyMadison.com and now recognize that their names have been exposed. Oh, no. We had all that security. We thought we were safe. And now we're busted. If that's what's going on here. Does that make sense? You guys know the Ashley Madison thing. I hope you watch the news. I mean, I hope you don't know it actually be better. Uh, but I think that's what's happening here. I mean, these are guys who are caught in their sin. Their shame is now exposed. That whole thing we were relying on and we thought we were safe in our adulteries, uh-oh, busted. So that's the first one. The divorce lawyers are warming up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, uh, Merchant's Lament. Can someone read for us then um, 11 through 17? This one goes a little longer. 11 through 17. Okay. Thanks, Nancy. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen, purple, silk and scarlet cloth, every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron and marble. Cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense, myrrh and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and carriages and bodies and souls of men. They will say, the fruit you long for is gone from you. All your riches and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at their torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe, O great city, dressed in fine linen, purple, and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Stop there. Yeah, please. Can someone go to uh, James chapter 5, verses 1 through 4? And if someone else could do Luke 6, 25 for us, please. Now, as we're looking those up, here are the merchants who have gained commercial gain because of, because of Rome uh, and have made a lot of money off of her. And they start listing all the things that basically you would find in the markets. And these are just the things they would sell. I don't think we need to read too much into this. It's just kind of like an extensive way of saying all of our commerce is <coughs> gone. It's just done. Now, it is interesting to note that the last two there, slaves and human souls, um, that these people, I mean, how sick was Rome? They were treating people like merchandise, right? We, we have this own, in our own history of our country. Uh, people treated like merchandise. Um, 
And so you hear that end and you're like, yep, this is justice being served here. This is not, this is not good. Um, but these are the things that made for wealth and extravagance and money, and this is how the, the merchants made their money. So the reason they're mourning now is because, whoa, whoa, she's gone. That was our money. That's what we were, there goes our, our commerce. That's our livelihood. Now that Rome has fallen, now that Babylon is gone, our commerce is out the window, and we're done for. So the judgment falls on them too. Because where were they putting their hope? In, in the business. In the business, in the money, in the fact that Rome would be there always to buy. Now go to James 5, 1 through 4. Whoever has that one? Go for it, David. Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth has rotted, and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. And there in, in James, he's remarkably talking probably to Christians in the church who are, um, one, trusting in their money, and two, trusting in their money to the extent that they can justify um, abusing slaves and all that kind of stuff. You know, we can use people for commercial gain, something along these lines. And so uh, you, you get kind of the same idea. The, the other uh, text, we, we won't go to the Luke 6 text, uh, but the other one you want to think about is that the Luke 12 parable where Jesus says, uh, tells the story of the guy who you know, gets all of his... Um, isn't, this, isn't this like sign language for wheat? Uh, all of his wheat, I can't remember what it was. Uh, all of his wheat, and he stores it up in barns, and he goes, oh, I don't need to work anymore. I'm going to store up all that stuff in my barns. I'm going to go, and I'm going to you know, get a retirement facility there. In, uh, retirement facility. I'm going to get a retirement home uh, in... <laughs> In Hawaii, and I'm going to live on my wealth for the rest of my days. And God says, "You fool! Stuff's burned up tonight. You're not. Your life is demanded of you. Why store up things for yourself on earth when you should be storing up treasure in heaven? You see. And the merchants are those who have not heeded this call. Here, at least these merchants are those who have not heeded this call and have stored up their treasures on earth. What happens when the storehouses of those treasures is burnt up? Putting your hope in, putting your hope in the economy, it's not a good place to put your hope. So, so store up treasures in heaven. This is the the terrifying end for those who trust in their wealth. Okay. Next, um, and then again, notice this: in a single hour, they stand off just like uh, they stand off in the distance, just like the kings. And in a single hour, they mention, "Oh no." And I like how they describe the outfit of the beast. Oh, or of the, of the of Babylon. She was clothed so beautifully. We say this about people, right? I mean, when wealthy people die, rich, famous people, like, oh, she was just so beautifully dressed. Like when I don't know if Liz Taylor ever dies. Did Liz Taylor die? I don't know. Yeah, she did. Did she? Yeah. And I mean, that's what people remember. Oh, how beautifully dressed she was. So what? Not now. I mean, that's, that's a very bad way of saying it, but I mean, you think about this. If your hope is in nothing more than being well-dressed in this life, how sad that is. Just, <clears throat> okay. Um, shipmasters, can someone read... Uh, go verse... Let's see. The end of 17 through... 19, please. Okay. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand far off. When they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, Was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads and with weeping and mourning cry out, Woe, woe, O great city, where are all who had ships on the sea? became rich through her wealth. In one hour, she has been brought to ruin. Now, let me ask you guys this. In your translations, when they're, when they're singing the funeral stuff, the woes and all that business, 
Is it marked off differently? Like, is it is the paragraphing of it different? It's indented. Yeah, yeah it's indented. Yeah, as okay. If it's poetry. Now, in yours, does the indentation end with verse twenty and start something new, or does it look like a continuation of the quote? Verse twenty is a continuation. See, that's interesting. So does mine. And then verse twenty one is. So then another angel shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back out. Yeah, okay. And then it comes back in. Because it reads here almost like it's the shipmasters commanding the saints to praise God because they're not undergoing this or something. Um, I'm not sure that's the right way to read that or not. Because um, you got to understand, in the Greek language, they don't have paragraphing like this. In the Greek language, it's just lines across a page. And sometimes to fill in, they'll write down like this and backward. I mean, it's just, it's so it doesn't work this way. So you're kind of making an educated guess that this is a continuation of the quote. And it makes sense that it would be simply because there's no other break there in conversation. But I just think it's an interesting well, it's thing to have the enemies and those mourning now telling the saints to rejoice. Go ahead, Is it that or is it more of a narration and now they're speaking directly to the saved? Who? Is who speaking? The narrator? Yes. Oh, I see. You see what I'm, It says, rejoice over her, O heaven. To you all, rejoice that she's being destroyed. Yeah, I don't know. See, in mine, the the um, the quotation marks they begin at the word "woe" and they end with the end of verse twenty. Yeah, you're right. So it's like one yeah. quote. Now, it actually, if we want to do this, and I, I mean, this is kind of a superfluous conversation; it doesn't really matter. But I mean, I do think it is, it is interesting to sort of say, "Here's those who have lost conceding." You were right. We were wrong. Woe to them. Woe to us. You should rejoice because the victory is yours. Something like this. Um, I just, it's just a weird, kind of a weird thing. All right, anyhow, uh, let's just, uh, there's not much to say about the seafarers. The reason they're probably pointed out is because a lot of commerce took place on the sea. Uh, in the Ezekiel text, um, when they're mourning Babylon, they're mourning the demise of Tyre. It's not Babylon, I'm sorry, but it's the, they're de mourning the demise of Tyre. And Tyre was a very significant um, uh, sea, uh, seaport. Seaport, thank you. And so that's probably why this is in here, just kind of following the pattern of Ezekiel. Uh, but also because Rome probably had some power on the sea, you know. So I mean, there you go. Okay. I think you're right. It's the sea yeah. captain saying, "Whoa," well, and then rejoice. Oh, you're you're right. They're, it's like they're admitting you were you were you, right. You won. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, and so now the call is for the victors to celebrate. So can someone read 20? Well, let's just read verse 20. Rejoice over her, O heaven, and you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Uh, God was on your side. Uh, here, uh, this, you know, before we make it sound, sound too unlutheran, God justified you. God declared you righteous. He declared you right by trusting in Jesus, who he justified by raising from the dead. Something along these lines. It's weird to say something like God justified Jesus, but God vindicated Christ is usually a better way of saying that. And we are justified in him. But you are vindicated in your faith now, dear saints. We have lost. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God the Father, even the losers, so to speak. Does that make sense? And that's what we're seeing there. Um... And now, <clears throat> notice how the tables are turning. Before, we've seen the people of the earth marveling at the beast, singing her praises, acknowledging her as glorious, and the saints crying out, how long, and mourning, and, and, and exile and suffering and all of this. And now here at this text, the tables turn. It's your turn to sing, saints, and we will enter into the eternal funeral song. It's your turn to rejoice, for God has declared you right. You see that? Um, and so um, this is where the psalmist says, e, uh, the morning um, wailing will last for the night. Morning will last for the night, but joy comes in the morning, something like this. Um, the death always comes before resurrection. You know, Good Friday becomes Easter. 
Good Friday is now over, and this is Easter morning showing up, something along these lines, okay? Um, so that's where we're at here. Uh, so then, I'm just going to finish this off here. Um, then another, uh, then a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon, the great city, be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more. And a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more. And the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more. And the light of a lamp will shine in you no more. And the voice of a bridegroom and a bride will be heard in you no more. For you were merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all the nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and all who have been slain on earth. I mean, that is like a terrifying song. No more. No more. What's being taken away? All signs of life. There's no more commerce. There's no more production. There's no more, I mean, in a sense, there's no more image of God here. Even the best of your stuff is done for. And notice this. I think this is a very interesting thing to end on. The voice of the bridegroom and the bride will be heard in you no more. I think we've got a twofold thing going on there. One, it's all death and there's no hope of any more life. Because remember, this is the way the Bible understands marriage is, is part of the role of marriage is to continue life on the earth. Right? That's why you celebrate because life will continue uh, here through the marriage and the birth of the children and all of this. So that's like the, that's the big idea there. So that's part of the morning. There will be no more celebration of life here. And at the same time, in the next text, we're going to go to the uh, marriage feast of the Lamb. Which means, who's, who else's voice won't be heard here anymore? The gracious voice of Jesus. It's gone. There's no more mercy left. Or, or the church. Or the church, right, right, yeah, because the bride and the bridegroom. Right. Like, you won't hear the church anymore, and therefore you won't hear Christ. It's too late. Yeah, this is, this is the point of no return. It's a terrifying text. Uh, but that is, I think that is a very interesting uh, way John does this here before we get into the celebration. The celebration is for those in Christ who have suffered at the hands here of the prophets. Okay. Uh, real quickly, well... We'll start with this next week. Um, there's a discussion, if you ever read or learn anything about the Antichrist, there's a discussion about who is the Antichrist in the Bible. Uh, and in Revelation, where does the Antichrist show up? We're going to talk about this a little more next week. We're going to spend a ton of time on it. So, but early, in the, early on in the church, they were saying the harlot and the beast were the Antichrist. Um... And it seems to make sense to me that that's actually a pretty good argument. Uh, but the commentary I'm reading says, no, uh, the, con the Antichrist is actually going to be the dragon in Revelation, but you don't want to make that connection with the Antichrist that's spoken of in other places. So uh, that's a lot of nuance and a lot of work we have to do. So maybe we'll do that next Sunday um, and talk a little bit about the Antichrist and uh, move on from that, okay? And then go, go into chapter 19, which is a lot more fun and happy. Alright. Alright. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening to this Bible study presentation from Faith Lutheran Church in Moore Park, California. We hope this has helped you grow in your Christian faith and study of the Bible. For more information, visit us on the web at faithmoorpark.com. Music by Kevin McLeod.